Thank you for joining us, everyone. We'll start get started now. Um, welcome to today's uh, Lunch and Learn, 3D Printed Organs, the Future of Human Transplants. Uh, so as mentioned, this is a Lunch and Learn. <laughs> um, and Augustana is also celebrating 110 years uh, this year. So uh, whether you've uh, been to an event before or is this is your first time joining us. Uh, we hope that you'll enjoy this. So before we begin, we'd first like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather, traditionally known as Sinaskau Sapisis, uh, is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples. The land on which Augustana campus of the University of Alberta is located provided a traveling route and home to the Masquiches, Nahiawak, Mitsitapi, Nakota, and Sutina nations, the Métis, and other indigenous peoples. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as a community. So if you were here in the 10 minutes before, my name is Sydney Tanzoni. I'm the Advancement Communications Coordinator here at Augustana campus, and I will be your host for today. Uh, today's presentation is about 40 minutes in length, followed by a question period. Uh, we'll be collecting questions throughout the presentation. As I mentioned, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll share these questions with Tom and he will uh, answer them for you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Tom. Uh, today's speaker, Tom Turzen. Uh, Tom is an associate professor of biology here at the University of Alberta Augustana campus. He completed his PhD at Western University in 2007 and joined Augustana in 2009 after his postdoctoral studies at the University of Guelph. Tom has authored a textbook on developmental biology and has given many public presentations on four continents. He teaches genetics, molecular biology, and the gene and developmental biology. His interdisciplinary research is in the field of invertebrate color patterns. So uh, now I'd like to welcome Tom. Thank you, Sydney. And uh, I'm glad to be of service today and to share with you one interesting topic, which is fascinating for me. And I wanted actually to share that with broader community. And that is the topic of uh, printing 3D or 3D printing organs, uh, human organs. So that is the, the very new uh, field in regenerative medicine. And I would like to share some of the uh, prospects on this field. I'm not specialist for it, as you know, I'm geneticist and developmental biologist, but there is many intersections, for example, stem cells. And today we are going to mention many, uh, many different uh, aspects of it, and we'll try to fuse them together into one interdisciplinary view uh, about, about this. So, so I'm going to share my screen uh, with you. Uh, Sydney, if you can uh, switch off your presentation because I have mine. Okay, so I hope that you can see the presentation uh, and it's always uh, technical things, but at the same time, these are the marvels of modern technology and I'm truly grateful to existence of this technology so that we can uh, connect uh, even from different places in the world. So if you wonder about my accent, I'm originally from Serbia, but this is my pure Canadian accent because I did not speak English before uh, we immigrated to Canada in 2001. But I hope that uh, you will understand some of the, of the terms will be uh, uh, highly specific uh, for, for the field, but I'll try to explain them and I'll try to keep the presentation on the level which is understandable to pretty much, uh, pretty much everyone. Basically, that is my teaching philosophy. Uh, I don't like to complicate things and I teach things which are complicated, so uh, I, I'll try to, to simplify uh, the whole idea. So you can see on this first slide, 
basically a model of human heart, uh, which was printed using artificial materials, plastic materials. So that is not actually what we are going to talk about today, but I will start with, with the 3D printing technology. And this is just a model that can be used for teaching purposes. Uh, however, uh, although many parts of human body can be 3D printed and actually used for as, uh, as transplants, uh, that is not what I'm going to talk about uh, today. I will talk, I will talk about uh, real organs, 3D printed organs. And just at the very beginning to make clear that this is uh, just an experimental stage, experimental phase, but in the near future, there probably will be uh, quite, quite advancement in this field. And what is interesting, Canada has one of the leading roles. So this is worldwide uh, high technology uh, initiative, but Canada has a very important role. And I will mention uh, at the end, I will mention actually one Canadian contribution to it. So let's start uh, about 3D printers. Uh, you know, I, I'm not in that field, but what is quite interesting is that uh, in 80s, uh, when the computer technology became uh, accessible to, to pretty much all people, uh, printers which print uh, in two dimensions, basically text or images on the paper, uh, were something that uh, and technology that was utilized. And then some people asked the question, okay, if we can make 2D prints, can we also make 3D prints? Can we print three-dimensional objects? And uh, very soon technology developed. So basically 3D print printing is nothing new today. Uh, basically in elementary schools at home, uh, even in the pub public libraries, you can find 3D printers. So on this slide, you can see uh, basically one 3D printer that uh, students in elementary school can use uh, to actually make uh, toys and models, Eiffel Tower here. And of course, cartridge, which is used in 3D printers is some sort of plastic. Uh, which is very flexible and allows actually the, the printing head to uh, move in three dimensions and to build uh, different objects. Now on the left, you can see one much larger printer in one company which makes uh, printouts of objects made of concrete. So you can see a printer is huge. You can see one, one person here just as comparison of the size and then different objects made of concrete. So in this case, concrete has been used as a printing material or ink, if you like. Now, uh, what is interesting is that printing uh, of three-dimensional three objects uh, is basically limitless. So at the present, uh, there are even attempts to print houses and uh, that became actually uh, possibility. So on this slide, you can see a 3D printed house. I mean, it's modest house, but still uh, quite nice. And uh, basically for $4,000, you can print houses. And then there, there are many initiatives in third world countries to actually provide homes to people who cannot afford it uh, using this technology. But there are also many other, uh, other uh, aspects of this, for example, in Europe and some other places, even two-story buildings can be printed. But the problem is that printer always has to be bigger than, than the, the object that you print. Uh, so at the end, the question is what is feasible to do? Sometimes it's printing from different parts and then assembly, but sometimes like these small houses, uh, entire object was printed. Now, uh, this was uh, broadcasted at uh, CTV News. So it's also Canadian initiative just in 3D printing uh, of houses in 2018. So you can see that Canada is basically on the front line of uh, several technologies that will converge uh, in this presentation when, when we talk about uh, printing, uh, printing organs. Now, what you can notice on this slide you know, we uh, scientists in natural sciences always like to observe things which, uh, and notice things which 
you don't always notice is that you can see here some lights and you can see also some plants, so some decorations. So of course, not everything here was printed, 3D printed. So this is just uh, the way how it is. If you print a house, you still need to do wiring and installations, plumbing. Uh, so it is not complete thing. You need to add some, some details. Now, why I'm mentioning that is because the similar situation is with, with the organs. So if you attempt to print a organ, uh, of course, you're going to use cells and, uh, and uh, extracellular matrix, which is material that we're built of. But eventually, organs will require blood vessels, with, will uh, require nerves uh, to be functional. So you cannot print everything. You need to use some other methods as well quite analogous to what we, uh, what we can see in printing uh, houses and similar uh, complex objects. So keep that on mind. Now, uh, I will have one poll question for our audience, and I hope that we can, uh, we can use that technology. So the question for you is, uh, are there uh, 3D printers in our body? What do you think? Okay, so we do uh, we do quite a number of answers, and most of you say yes. So sixty nine percent of you say uh, say yes, and some are unsure. Some say no. Okay, so the answer is yes. We do uh, have three D printers in our body, but they're very very small. Now, some of you might think also about uterus as being 3D printer, but not really. So that analogy is not complete. Uh, I mean, uh, we all uh, came to this world uh, through birth and the uterus is amazing and motherhood is amazing experience, but we can consider uterus and the program of development uh, as a complex genetic program, which does have some, some uh, aspects of 3D printing, but not entirely. It's more based on growth. It's not based on the placement of tissues, but on the growth and development. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there is connection even when we think about uterus as bioreactor in which complex organisms can develop. We also can think about bioreactors in which we can uh, perfect printed organs. So there's some artificial bioreactors and I will mention them later. But the, the real answer to the question, are there 3D printers in our body is yes, and there are billions of them. So those are uh, ribosomes. Now, what are ribosomes? Uh, they are, okay, for some reason, Okay, uh, ribosomes are very complex, yet very, very small uh, macro, macromolecular conglomerates, which are actually um, known for quite some time. So on this slide, you can see uh, one detail of animal or human cell. And as you know, our body is made of cells and of huge number of cells. So cell is the, the key major unit of life. Uh, and all biochemical processes uh, occur within the cell. All our tissues and organs are made of cells. So basically we are made of cells and human body has from 30 to 50 trillion of cells, which is amazing number and amazing complexity. Now within each cell here, you can see just one of these cells Okay, just detail. There are many organelles like nucleus where DNA is and many other organelles, which are not the topic of today's presentation. But what you can see here uh, is 
three ribosomes that you can see labeled here. So these tiny dots are free ribosomes. And they're also ribosomes attached to membrane systems on endoplasmatic reticulum. Now, these ribosomes are machines for printing proteins. So we are made of proteins. Uh, our bodies are mostly made of proteins and all biochemical reactions are mostly controlled by proteins. And these proteins are coded as software within DNA. So DNA is the software, but the machines that print those proteins according to, to the information within DNA are ribosomes. So each this tiny ribosome is actually 3D printer. Why? Well, because information in DNA is linear. It's just the sequence of letters, ATGC letters within DNA that codes for different amino acids that are building blocks of proteins. So to make these proteins, uh, you need to have linear information uh, translated into three-dimensional proteins. So yes, we do have uh, 3D printers in our body and we have basically not billions, but trillions. Uh, one average cell has thousands and thousands of uh, almost 1 million of these, uh, these ribosomes, which is amazing because each of these ribosomes you can consider as one 3D printer. Now on this slide, you can see the model, uh, which is very accurate model. So each tiny bubble here, each tiny sphere, represents individual atom, which means that science is so advanced today that we understand exactly how these ribosomes are built. Uh, of course, this is in artificial colors. So this, uh, this uh, purple and turquoise uh, parts and patches are different proteins. So even ribosomes as machines for printing proteins are made of proteins and some uh, RNA molecules. And inside the ribosome, uh, there are three chambers. They're labeled as E, P, and A chambers. I'm not going to go into details because again, this is not the, the focus of, of our presentation, but just to show you that nature actually has 3D printers uh, that can print uh, organic molecules. Uh, so this is how ribosome looks. And then through the process of translation, here represented schematically uh, ribosome, and here again represented more precisely, there are two subunits. Uh, this, ri this ribosome can read the instruction from the nucleus, from the DNA, which is messenger RNA transcript, which is software telling this, this ribosome how and what to print. And then ribosome is going to print polypeptide, which is basically a protein that will be printed. And each unit here is one amino acid. Position of each amino acid is determined within the sequence of the gene. On schematic representation, you can see that even in this 3D printer, which is minute, and we have uh, thousands and thousands of them in each cell, uh, you need cartridge. Okay, so that is the general principle of 3D printing. You need to have some sort of cartridge and material from which you're going to make print, but you also need to have a software. So you always need to have program which will control machine. So you have hardware and software. Analogy is complete with, with, with uh, our, uh, what, what we have in, uh, in our technology. So the cartridge is basically tRNA, which is small molecule bringing amino acids into the ribosome. And then ribosome is printing these amino acids, joining them together through peptide bonds. And voila, at the end of this process, you get a three-dimensional protein, which then needs to be shaped and transported to, to its location in our body. And that is the way how we actually get our three-dimensional bodies. So our entire body, when you look yourself in the mirror, uh, what you see is made by natural 3D printers, uh, which is an uh, amazing fact for, for me and uh, many people are not aware, aware of it. 
Now, 3D printing has different aspects. And as I mentioned, uh, and as we have also on the title, uh, title slide, uh, we can make prints of organs made, made of artificial materials. But uh, that is one aspect of it that I'm not going to focus, but we also need to keep that in mind because it's important for scaffolding the, the organs that then uh, stem cells can populate and can make actually the actual, actual organic organs. So here uh, you can see model, quite accurate model of humor, human tongue, but it's made, made of artificial materials, silicon materials. However, this technology can help us in future uh, to make quite pre precise artificial replicas of humans, robots, and, and, and uh, something which will resemble, resemble humans yet will be artificial. And of course, there are many other, uh, other fields in which uh, this technology is applicable. So what you can see here are the details which exactly uh, represent the, the shape and the surface of human tongue with all receptors and taste buds that we use. So that's 3D, 3D technology uh, developed well before actually humans uh, figured out that we can use that also to print organs and different tissues. So now we need to shift to the other part of the story and that is using human cells and human tissues in artificial environment to mimic uh, different capabilities of our body, which is very important, for example, for, for pharma pharmaceutical industry. And this technology here, you can see one of the papers uh, is also relative, relatively uh, novel and uh, field which is developing, but this technology can be used to use actual human cells in some sort of cell culture, which is well controlled and we call it chip. So basically you can put human cells on chip in the fluid which mimics uh, blood circulation and all the fluids that, that bring nutrients and oxygen to our tissues. But you also can add different chemicals and then observe how human tissues will actually react to different chemicals. So this is very important and it's better than using laboratory animals. Here you can use human cells to test different drugs and chemicals. And again, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. Now, there are different chips that are used. And here you can see liver chip and uh, you can see how fluid uh, is going. And, here you have kidney chips. So you can combine these chips with human cells and human cells imitate the, their actual work in the organs and you can connect these chips. So different chips for different organs can be interconnected and there is flow of these fluids. And basically you can make quite complex models of human body. And more, uh, what, what is quite interesting is that you can make different chambers and you can imitate different tissues within the same organ. So this technology is called organs on a chip. So you can make kidney on a chip, you can make heart on a chip, even brain, liver, and different organs. Uh, the shape of it is, not, uh, is nothing like the actual organ but the cells and the tissues which are alive in, the, in these machines, uh, they're functional. So you can study uh, human functionality uh, in, these, in these artificial settings. So that is one step toward artificial organs. And uh, quite interestingly, you can, because there is now technology and there, there are companies that do this, you can combine all these different chips together so that you can even mimic entire human body. So you can make human on a chip. And here you can see testing of tumor cells and different cures uh, to, to, to the tumors, but you also can uh, at the same time follow what is happening and what are the side effects to other tissues. So I find this technology also quite impressive 
And that technology is related to 3D printed organs because you have now living tissues in artificial setting and you can keep them alive and you can control them. Now, to really understand 3D organs, we need to say a couple words about stem cells. So stem cells, you cannot, if you observe them under, under the microscope, you cannot make any difference between stem cell and any other cell of our body. But they're special cells because they have features of embryonic cells. So even adults have stem cells, which are embryonic cells, and these cells allow, allow us to replace old cells, to replace old tissues, and to heal wounds. Otherwise, without stem cells, we would not be, uh, be able to heal any wound, even minor cut or anything like that. So stem cells are very important for regenerative medicine. And in the last 30 years, there was huge advancement in our understanding of stem cells. So they do have molecular markers that we can use to recognize them. Otherwise, we would not be able to distinguish them between billions of our cells. But in this way, we can isolate them. We can rear them in vitro in the laboratory. And we can follow actually what they do. And cells, they communicate using chemical signals. They have very complex language of chemical signals. And we can actually instruct stem cells to produce different types of tissues. So on this slide, you can see stem cell. And one of the features of stem cells is that they divide in the way that one cell starts differentiation and another daughter cell remains stem cell. So in that way, we maintain the pool of stem cells. And at the same time, uh, part of daughter cells start, uh, start differentiation and production of uh, adult tissues or differentiated tissues. So uh, in purple are stem cells. Then in blue are progenitor cells. So those, those are the descendants uh, that move towards differentiation. And in yellow is representation of actually differentiated cells. So when we say differentiated cells, those are cells which can be uh, skin cells or muscle cells or brain cells, neurons. So these are completely differentiated functional cells and we can produce them in vitro. So on this slide, schematically, you can see that starting from the stem cells in in vitro culture, using different chemical signals, we can grow them and select them to produce different types of adult tissues. Now, why that is important? Well, we need cartridge for 3D printers uh, of organs. And the only cartridge we can use are actually stem cells. So stem cells are the material that people use when they print organs. They make the model, and then that model needs to spend some time in bioreactors. You remember at the beginning, we mentioned uh, uterus as one amazing bioreactor. So there are artificial bioreactors in which actually this population of stem cells, once printing of 3D organ is finished, can, con uh, can continue growing and differentiating into, uh, into functional organ. So for 3D printing of organs, it's not just for regular 3D printing. You finish printing and that's it. You now can use your toy or house or whatever you printed. You need time, uh, several weeks usually, for that, uh, that creation to become functional uh, in these reactors and then can be used. Uh, and stem cells uh, also can be used in different ways. And basically, the, they are. Uh, responsible for the new revolution in, uh, reprodu uh, in uh, also in reproductive, but in regenerative medicine. Uh, on this slide, you can see all kinds of tissues that can be healed using stem cells. So basically you can isolate stem cells in vitro. You can grow a large number of them and then inject them back in the body. In that way, you bypass uh, the problem with immunity because our, our body will recognize foreign tissue. And that is one of the problems 
with transplants. Very often body because of immune system will not accept transplant. And in this way, when you use your own stem cells or embryonic stem cells, which, uh, which do not trigger immune response, uh, you can uh, grow tissues in vitro and you can grow cells and inject cells, which will then behave within the body, sensing different chemical signals in the way that they will differentiate and they, they will heal different tissues. Now, there are many, you can see here, whole list of many conditions that we can, uh, we can heal, or at least we're trying to heal somewhere with more success, somewhere with less success. But basically, there, there's huge hope in using stem cells itself. But now we need to join different, different fields, 3D printing and stem cells. And basically, we can use these stem cells, which have high hope and potency for healing, in actually making the organs. And that is, that is quite exciting. <coughs> Sorry. So I'm a fan of science fiction. And one of sci-fi movies, which was quite impressive to me, almost quarter century ago, was The Fifth Element. Some of you probably are familiar with the movie. And the uh, uh, main female role uh, is uh, actress, which is actually originally from Serbia. So Serbia is a small country, and then we Serbs are very proud when, when some people become famous. Mila Jovic. But uh, in that movie, it's completely irrelevant what is the topic of, of movie. Uh, however, in that movie, in one scene, uh, there is a tissue, actually hand of a person, happened to be Mila Jovic, that survives uh, one crush. And the entire body is destroyed, but there is that hand. And then through the combination of cloning, and actually printing, 3D printing of entire body, machines in this chamber, which is some sort of bioreactor or incubator, uh, build entire body from the, the information preserved in that DNA from hand. And here you can see the detail, how at the end actually 3D printer uh, brings different tissues, in this case, muscles layer by layer, uh, restoring entire body. Now, at that time, I already, uh, already was a molecular biologist. And I said, no way, this technology will never exist. So this is just fantasy. So that was 1907, uh, 1997. And then in uh, 1999, uh, in, uh, at uh, Wake Forest Institute for Regener Regenerative Medicine in North Carolina, uh, basically first artificial bladders were grown. And uh, just two years later, not entire body, but one organ. And this lab succeeded in actually making these bladders uh, in the way that they used uh, bioplastic to make scaffold. So I mentioned that we can make models of organs, even, uh, even use them for transplantation, for example, for heap, artificial heap or something like that. But uh, they use these bioplastics that do not trigger immune response uh, to make scaffold for the organs. And then you can see if some person has problem with, with, with the bladder, you can actually partially reconstruct the bladder in vitro, taking cells, stem cells, and populating in vitro that plastic scaffold and then later transplanting it. So this was done uh, uh, initially, experimentally was in 1999, but by, by 2006, this technology uh, was used and basically bladder uh, today is the only successful <clears throat> organ that you can uh, rare artificially <clears throat> and transplant as such. There are many tissues, so we can rare tissue patches and transplant them, but in terms of organ, uh, bladder uh, is, and, and many people live with these, uh, these lab-grown bladders for years. So that is uh, quite, quite astonishing technology. However, it's not 3D printing. 
please notice that you use stem cells. So you use cartridge for 3D printer, you use scaffold, but you did not actually use 3D printer. So you can see that these new technologies emerged and fused together into something completely new and, and uh, different aspects of it were step-by-step step achieved in different laboratories. And now we have great unification of these different technologies. So here you can see uh, in Massachusetts General Hospital, one, one um, research group that was able to grow again, based on these plastic scaffolds and uh, the, the stem cells were able to use uh, uh, to, to grow in the incubator. So this is that bioreactor. Uh, we're able to grow human heart, which even has functionality. Now the quality of it, it's still not sufficient for transplantation, but uh, they're, making, they're making progress. And these hearts can make contractions. So these are organs that can contract. Now, why it is important to, uh, to achieve capability to make 3D printed organs? There's huge shortage of organs for transplantation. Many, many people suffer and they're on waiting lists. Uh, and uh, the, the demand for organs, mostly kidneys, but also heart and many other organs, demand is much bigger than what is available on the market. And uh, when I say market sounds a uh, little non-humane, but it is kind of market. If, if you have demand for something and uh, there is source for it, it is market, but has to be uh, regulated in very strict and careful uh, way uh, in terms of ethics. Uh, however, there's still not sufficient amount of organs that can be used for transplantations. And because of that, 3D printed organs are huge hope that very soon, maybe in a couple of years, uh, can drastically improve the life. If you just receive printed kidney or printed heart or something like that, uh, that will be a uh, technology, uh, life-saving technology. And now to go to the core uh, of, of this presentation is actually how these 3D printed organs work. So there was huge advancement published in 2019 in the journal Advanced Science. So one group of researchers from Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, were able to print, 3D print a miniature, so small model of human heart. And then later, hopefully, we will be able to put these, uh, these uh, human hearts in incubator and grow them to, to uh, needed needed size. But what we have here is really astonishing technology because you have 3D printers. So this machine here is 3D printer. And in these cubes, uh, you can see fluids that are actually a uh, medium for cell culture. And within that fluid printing head using cartridge will actually print the model, small model of human heart. And they achieved that couple couple years ago. So how it works is that basically you can you have to make that cartridge, and cartridge is made of hydrogel. Hydrogel is the basis of cartridge; is basically liquid, and it's obtained from so-called omentum. And omentum is connective tissue that connects our organs in abdomen. So you can rare that tissue, you can just take the sample from human, rare that tissue in lab, and then uh, sift the cells and separately produce hydrogel. So that hydrogel is basically the, the ink that you use. But within that medium, there are two different types of stem cells, cardiac stem cells and uh, endothelial stem cells that make two different layers of human heart. So you can make different cartridges and use different heads for printing. You need software, same as in ribosome, when, when we print individual proteins here, you need software, which will give 3D shape of human heart. And then this printer in the medium of cell culture can print miniature organ 
quite amazing. But these hearts are still, so this is still experimental work. They're not functional yet. Uh, however, what is successfully, uh, what has been successfully done is the printing, uh, printing tissue patches. So here you can see printing cardiac patch, and then you can keep it in the culture to allow vascularization, so growth in of blood vessels, and then you can transplant these patches uh, without fear that transplanted tissue will be rejected. So this is uh, this is quite amazing technology. And uh, printing of different organs is on, on the horizon. When you do a Google search or whatever, you, you can see that now many labs develop this. And, and I'm quite, uh, quite positive that in, let's say, next 10 years, that will, be, uh, that will become routine. Now, uh, at the end, I would like to mention one more technology, which actually does not require making any scaffold uh, of any kind, but just using cells, human cells for 3D printing. So here is, and I'm not making any advertisement for this company, BioPixlar uh, company uh, made quite interesting advancement recently. And that is making 3D printers for cells where you can use individual cells. And you remember that human body is made of 30 to 50 trillions of cells. So we can use individual cells to uh, actually print them uh, and form the tissues. And one printer, so here is under magnification in tiny Petri, Petri dishes in, uh, in uh, that medium for cell, cell culture. This is the head of printer. And that head of printer can add one by one living cell and survival rate of these cells is 95%. So 95% of printed cells will survive. And at the same time, three types of cells can be printed using single head. Now, human, human body has about two, 200 different types of tissues. And uh, this is like the beginning of printing in color. You know, first it was just uh, some basic color or two or three colors. Now we have full color uh, printing. So similar with this technology, we are actually going towards the goal to be able to print literally almost entire body or entire body as we have in that science fiction movie from 1997. So this printer will position cells one by one using one cell as one pixel in image. In digital images, we use pixels as uh, units of information, visual information. Here we use individual cells as pixels for tissue printing. And you can see here printed numbers one, two, and three with three different types of cells labeled fluorescently. And it's quite amazing technology. So each dot is individual cells that you cannot see them by naked eye. But when you look through the microscope, these guys can print numbers that are alive. Uh, quite, uh, quite impressive technology. And for the end, to mention uh, Canadian advancement in this field, so University of Toronto uh, made 3D printer that probably will be the first one to be in broad use. Why? Because it uses a 3D skin uh, printer and skin is an organ. So when you say an organ, people usually think about heart, kidneys, brain, something like that. But we forget that skin is actually our, our largest organ. Skin is a organ which covers our entire surface. And then in many accidents, uh, when people have serious burns, uh, the, the standard procedure is actually to graft healthy skin from other part of the body, uh, trying to cure that. But there are lots of uh, problems with scar tissue. And if the, the large surface of body gets burned, then you do not have sufficient amount of skin to graft. And then people die, unfortunately. So the group of scientists from University of Toronto made 3D skin printer in a way that you can use it as uh, that little device when, when you put together carton bo uh, cardboard boxes, and then you use uh, that uh, 
tape, masking tape, to put things together uh, in, in a fast way. So here you can see that printer, which is handheld, has a roller and cartridge contains stem cells, mesenchymal stroma cells, which are stem cells of our skin. And then uh, that printing head can go over wound, over burnt area, and can smear the cells that will then eventually start their development. First of all, will protect the surface, will prevent uh, infections, and then will start healing and regeneration of skin uh, in a way which was unimaginable uh, several years ago. So uh, they, they, um, their estimation is that in about five years, this technology will be, uh, will be available uh, to use in clinics. So that is what I wanted to share with you today. The conclusion is technology is uh, truly amazing and exciting and we need to, to follow it. And uh, very often we're not even aware what kinds of miracles and, and te new technologies are around. So uh, it was my pleasure to share, share this with you. Thank you very much. So our first question is, um, do you think that 3D printed organs will ever replace the need for organ don donation? That is the idea. So the hope is then when technology becomes efficient in the way that we truly can make 3D printed organs, uh, the idea is to replace uh, the actual organs because demand is uh, exceeding uh, the, the, the available organs, but there are also many problems and ethical problems with, uh, with the actual organs. I mean, it's very nice, and that is one entirely different topic. We can talk about that, but just to mention what the problem is. So it's very nice, it's very humane. When on our driving license, we circle that, that will be organ donors in the case of, of accident or something like that. But at the same time, you need to keep in mind that to take organ, to harvest organ from the body which where brain is dead, you actually are taking organs from still alive organism. And the question is when human life ends. So that is ethical question. And, and uh, yes, we need to save as many lives as we can. But at the same time, we need to be careful about uh, ethical aspects. Now, this 3D printing would completely bypass that ethical problem and would provide sufficient amount of, of organs uh, for, for entire human, human race. For sure. Uh, so uh, we have another question that's come in from the same person. Um, so, um, and actually she's an alumna of Augustana. So hi, Jamie. Um, can you outline how organ rejection differs with 3D printed organs? Um, are there any studies outlining whether 3D printed organs are better or worse than human don donor organs from the perspective of rejection statistics? Yeah, so yes. there's lots of evidence because when, when you uh, make patches, so not entire organs, but uh, at today's uh, level of technology, we can actually transplant patches of tissues. And uh, the way how we get these patches is through isolation of stem cells. So basically you first take stem cell from same individual, you grow these stem cells in the lab, and then you use them as cartridge. Therefore, the, uh, there is no rejection of tissue because that's your own tissue. It's grown artificially, but it's your own tissue, all your markers and antigens, so, so no, no way to refuse it. And uh, the, the clinical uh, research shows that these patches are quite, quite stable, so that they do not get rejected. When you get organ from somebody else, there is the list of different markers that need to match, but that still is not perfect match because each individual is unique. And sometimes we don't know what can be recognized uh, in immune response. So there, there's no perfect match. Okay, but here you actually have perfect match because as cartridge, you use cells from that, that individual. 
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question this time from James Kiriuki, who is a professor here at Augustana. So he asks, how expensive are the materials used to print 3D organs? I ask because I assume that the material used will have to be biocompatible to avoid rejection by the body. So uh, related in a way. Yes, yeah, so that bioplastic that is used, I mean, I'm not chemist, so <laughs> maybe even James can answer that better than me, but bioplastics, uh, once, once you have it, once you have technology to use it, it is not really that expensive because you don't need to make that from platinum or, or, or from gold. So these, these are materials that are not really expensive. What is problematic is just to get that technology to work. But to maintain the, the cells and that tissue, which is living tissue that we use for 3D printers, uh, well, basically we can, we can do that without much limit. So it's inexpensive because you just need uh, the, the solutions uh, and mediums for cell growth. And that is something which is routinely used. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's not for free, but it, it, the, I would say the cost is not something significant in this technology. Perfect. So uh, another question for you. When creating organs around a scaffold, what happens to the scaffold? Does it stay in the organ? Yeah, so these scaffolds, I mean, in some cases, they, they can be gradually replaced with the, with the actual connective tissue. Some of them are biodegradable, but uh, you need to be careful to make materials that will not uh, degradate too soon. Okay, because our, our body has enzymes and many different mechanisms, how we replace our own tissues. Basically every three years, we replace all our soft tissues. I'm not the same person as three years ago. Uh, in terms of material building of, of my body. Uh, so some of these materials can stay, there, there are different types of materials. Some of them are biodegradable, uh, but uh, basically depends on, on the type of tissue. Do, do you need more stable structure or do you need just a tissue patch or something like that? In some cases, there's even not, no need for, for scaffold. Awesome. So uh, we have a question that's been submitted by Leah. So thank you, Leah. Uh, what do you think remains the biggest challenge or hurdle that still needs to be overcome to make these 3D printed organs functional for transplants? So I think that the, the biggest problem is the complexity of our organs. For example, human body has about 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels in that are relatively small volume, we have huge complexity, just talking about blood vessels and capillaries and everything. When you make organ, you have to make sure that each organ is well vascularized, that has sufficient, uh, a sufficient uh, amount of oxygen and nutrients that can, can be brought to the organ. And uh, also that uh, nerves can grow into the organ. So the, the problem that, as I see it, although I'm, I'm not specialist for the field, but from the perspective of biologist, the key problem is first the size, because we still do not have printers that can uh, make adult full-size uh, organs uh, using 3D printing. We can, we can grow organs in these bioreactors, but just using 3D printer to make full-size organ is still something that we cannot cannot do in this moment. Uh, of course, skin is the exception. So that Toronto initiative, uh, I, I'm very hopeful uh, about that because skin is very thin. And basically when you smear that these cells, you can actually form artificially, uh, artificial skin. But for the organs like heart or kidney is way more difficult because uh, there's so many blood vessels that our knowledge of vascularization in vitro and these bioreactors, they need to be advanced. So I don't see the problem in 3D printing itself with the exception of the size. So we need to increase capability of size, but the key problem is uh, post printing processing in these bioreactors where you need to control uh, conditions in the way that blood vessels and nerves and everything else can grow in, in a way that is sufficient. Otherwise you would transplant organ that would suffer lack of oxygen or something like that. So you do not actually solve the problem. You need to, to 
make fully functional organ. And that is the key problem. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and so uh, the last question we'll be answering today comes from Aurora. So uh, she is from the Augustana Science Club. So thank you for submitting this. Uh, do you think there are ethical constraints to using this technology because stem cell collection must come from either adult donors, which could be limited, or from embryonic sources, which is controversial? Yes, so for as long as we use adult stem cells, there is no problem, but, but uh, in terms of ethics. But the problem with stem cells, and I did not have sufficient time to go into details about stem cells. The problem is that adult stem cells, which can regenerate our tissues, they have limited capability to produce different types of tissues. And uh, actually uh, multipotent and totipotent cells stem cells that can produce different tissues, those are actually embryonic cells. And the way how we get these embryonic cells, that's, that's not necessarily, actually you do not do that from the same person. From the same person, you take adult cells, you grow them for specific tissue that you need patch or something like that. But to make complete organ, you, you need to make different tissue types for that organ. And then a better source would be embryonic stem cells. They will not trigger immune response. Embryonic cells, uh, cells do not do that. But the problem is the way how we get these embryonic cells. So for, for people who try to get uh, uh, artificial uh, fertilization, uh, sometimes they have excess of embryos that remain in the freezer and then people put the waiver uh, so for that material to be used in research purposes or, or, or whatever. Uh, but the question is when human life starts, are these early embryos that can be frozen and unfrozen and they can be alive and they, they can be used to take the cells, uh, how moral or immoral that is. So there is uh, that moral problem in the story of taking and using embryonic cells. But most of research uh, done is basically taking cells from the person, adult cells, and there, there's, no, uh, there's no really uh, any problem in that sense. Uh, moreover, as time progresses and our knowledge increases, now is more and more uh, possible to take these adult stem cells and de-differentiate them to the level that they can produce different tissues. So I think that is the solution for this problem, our capability to completely de-differentiate uh, adult cells. And that is technology we actually uh, know and have from the cloning exper experiments. You know that Dolly, where you de-differentiate adult cell and can produce entire embryos. So basically we do have that technology just needs to be more advanced. And I personally would be against using embryonic stem cells in this. Well, perfect. Thank you so much for your presentation today, Tom, and for giving us an overview of this emerging field of study. So uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, just some uh, kind of uh, shop items here. Um, so you have, you can see my screen again. So um, if, um, if you would like to hear more from Tom, he is giving a talk uh, next week, November 24th, titled Molecular Genetics of COVID-19, Answers to Questions You Didn't Ask. This is hosted by Augustana Science Club. If you would like to learn more and register, you can register, uh, you can email them at augscienceclub at gmail.com. And uh, Augustana campus has uh, two more webinars later this week, this time hosted by the Chester Ronning Center. Uh, and they are welcoming Sarah Hurwitz, who is the former chief speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama. Uh, to learn more and register for these events, please visit aug.ualberta.ca forward slash Ronning. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a lunch, a lunch and learn. Our next lunch and learn uh, is early December and it's titled the 2020 Nobel Prizes uh, and it will feature four faculty members from Augustana including Tom he will be back uh, as they give a brief overview of the 2020 Nobel Prizes awarded in medicine literature chemistry and peace so for further information and to register uh, you can visit aug.ualberta.ca forward slash 2020 Nobel lunch 
And to hear about other upcoming events, uh, follow us at U of A Augustana on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, once this webinar closes, a survey will pop up in your browser. Uh, as we are new to hosting webinars, we would really appreciate it if you could respond to this survey and help us improve. Uh, but other than that, that concludes our presentation. So thank you so much for joining us today and for supporting your Augustana campus. Thank you.